You know, I was thinking about communion uh, this week, and I thought, you know, at Christmas time, uh, we take opportunities to give gifts. And it's one of the, the joys at Christmas is giving gifts. And, uh, you know, when you're a kid, it's all about receiving gifts. And as you get older, it becomes all about giving gifts. And, um, and I was thinking about God and Jesus and how they are the greatest of gift givers. Um, in fact, the Bible tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from our Father above. And, it, and the Bible describes him as the father of lights, which is quite fascinating from a scientific standpoint. We don't have time to get into all of that. But, uh, but nevertheless, he is the father of lights, the giver of all good and perfect gifts. And so we know that Jesus came not to serve, he told us, um, or not to be served, but to serve. And so he came as the, the ultimate servant, the ultimate gift giver. And so this morning, as we partake in communion together during this Christmas season, let's remember the greatest of gift givers, the one who gave his very life for us. And so would you join me as we partake in communion together? I'm just going to be re reading again this morning from Paul's um, instruction to the church there in Corinth as he gives them instructions on, um, on communion itself. And he says this, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we partake of the bread together? He goes on to say this. He says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Shall we drink together? Let's pray. Lord, we want to just thank you so much today for being the ultimate gift giver. We want to thank you, God, today that you are the, the source of all that is good and holy and righteous and that you provide gifts for your children, for us, the best gifts. In fact, you gave us your very life, Lord, and you took our place on that cross because you love us. There is no greater love you have told us than this, than if a man were to lay down his life for his brother. And so we know, God, that you have demonstrated your love to us in this, and that while we were still sinners, that you died for us. And so we come to you today, Lord, thanking you for the gift of eternal life, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of heaven, the gift of being able to spend forever with you. Thank you for being the kind of God that is not far away and distant, the kind of God that was, would turn his back on his creation. But thank you for creating us and for loving us enough to redeem us. And so I pray, Lord, that as we prepare to open up your word today, that you would just bless it, that we would hear you speak today, Lord, that you would just fill this place up with your presence. And we pray it in Jesus' name, Amen. Listen, we're we're in the we're in the middle of a series that uh, that I've called "Because of the Manger," and I am so excited about this. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the idea of how God is nearby. And uh, and if you remember last week, we talked about the gift. We we talked about how Isaiah describes this incredible gift in just one short little passage there one half of one verse, and we're going to shrink it down even farther today. We're going to look at just not even the second half of that verse, just a part of the second half of that verse today. Um, the two descriptions that are given there, the first two, I should say, 
of this child, of the son of Jesus. And you, you remember last week we talked about how Isaiah said, for to us, for to us, to you and I, to us a child is born, and to us, to you and I, to us a son is given. And he says, and the government will be on his shoulders. And so we talked about how Isaiah was describing the humanity of, of Jesus, how he was describing the deity of Jesus, how he was a son that was given, and how he was describing the sovereignty of Jesus, his ultimate control and reign as he describes the fact that the government will be on his shoulders. And I want to read this quote to you before we get into the message today. Just as a reminder, this was a Max Lucado quote that I had mentioned to you last week. And here's what Max Lucado says as he talks about the, the uniqueness and the incredible nature of Jesus coming down to the earth and being born in a stable, laid in a manger to a young mother, Mary. He says, you know, the moment that Mary touched God's face is the very moment that God made his case that there's no place that he will not go, that, that he is willing, if he's willing to be born in a barnyard, then you can expect him to be at work anywhere, in bars, in bedrooms, in brothels, in boardrooms. There's no place that's too common. There is no person that is too hardened, and there is no distance that is too far and there is no person that he cannot reach. There is no limit to his love. And so we're going to be exploring the idea today that God is not some distant being, some creator that's away from us, that he sort of spun things into existence and then walked away for it to just run its course, but he is a God who is nearby. And so would you read with me Isaiah chapter 9, Verse 6, once again, as we look here at this incredible description of, of the Savior, of the Messiah, of Jesus. And so Isaiah writes these famous words, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And then he gives us a description. He sort of describes him. He, he lists some characteristics of Jesus. We're going to look at the first two this morning. He says that he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And so today I want to focus on those first two. I want to talk to you just a little bit about the idea of Jesus being a Wonderful Counselor and a Mighty God. And, and actually what we're going to do is we're going to go with the second one first. I want to take some time and talk about Jesus as the mighty God. You see, he is the mighty God. And when you read scripture, you will read all of the characteristics and traits of him. And we've come up with some pretty interesting words. We'll, we'll call them the omni words, okay? But, but these omni words are this, that, that Jesus is omniscient, he's omnipotent, and he's omnipresent. Well, what does that mean? Omniscient means he's all-knowing. Omnipotent means he's all powerful. Omnipresent means he's everywhere all at the same time. He is not some distant God that's far off, that's not walking here with you and I, or that's not in our midst or in our presence. He is here, he is everywhere, and he is not far off. You know, one commentator, as I was reading, actually several, it wasn't just one, said that the description of Jesus as a mighty God is almost like the description of a superhero. He is the mighty God. He is the superhero of all superheroes. You know, my favorite superhero was Superman. I mean, it was easy for me to like Superman because he had, it seemed like, all the powers wrapped up into one. I thought, boy, this guy, he's, he's you know, uh, faster than a speeding bullet. He's stronger than a locomotive. He's, you know, I mean, he can blow things down with, he can fly. He can, I mean, he can do all of these things. He has laser vision. I mean, all this stuff. Uh, he was, in my mind, the ultimate of superheroes. Well, God is far more powerful than Superman would ever be or could be. He is the mighty God. He is the superhero of all superheroes. And he is omniscient. He is all 
knowing. That's a scary thought, by the way, when you're trying to hide from God because you cannot hide from Him. He is all-knowing. And He is everywhere all at the same time, so you can't hide from Him in that sense either. He is omnipresent. And He is all-powerful. His power is endless, by the way. You know, the disciples, when they were in the boat with Jesus and Jesus was sleeping and the storm came up, which, by the way, there was a terrible storm that came across the middle of our nation over in Kansas. We need to be praying for those people uh, that were impacted by this storm, uh, this tornado. But Jesus was in the middle of this boat and this crazy storm came and the disciples were fearful and were crying out and got angry at Jesus because he was asleep. And you remember, he woke up, he rebuked them for no, having no faith. He calmed the wind and the waves. And their response was, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Uh, listen, th- there's something nuanced in that statement. It's not that the wind and the waves just responded to his request. No, they obey him. He is their master. He is the master of all creation. He didn't just create it, spin the earth, and leave it to be there. He is the master of it all. He can speed it up, slow it down, move it around. He can do whatever he wants. And just with, the, with his voice, that's why you'll often hear me pray in my prayers, God, please speak to us, because I really believe that when God speaks, <laughs> universes are created, okay, I mean, it's the spoken voice and word of God that is so powerful. And so I, in my own life, long to hear God speak. Because when he speaks, we experience his miracles. I started thinking about sort of the power of God. And I, I'm kind of a sort of a logical, scientific mind. I, I love that. And it's probably why I pursued psychology. I just, I love to think these kinds of thoughts and do all those things. But how big is God's creation? How big is it, right? How big is the universe? Does anybody know? Well, scientists have estimated, and by the way, this number, every few years it grows. (laughs) It just grows because our technology increases, and we can see farther and deeper into the universe. But today, as scientists estimate that the radius, you know the radius is half of a diameter, right? So the radius of the universe is estimated to be, be... approximately 93 billion light years across, okay? So what is a light year? Well, a light year is how far light can travel in one year, which is approximately 5.9 trillion miles. So 5.9 trillion miles is a light year. The radius, which is half of the universe, is what scientists estimate now, is 93 billion with a B, light years across. Well, it's so big that you'll never be able to (laughs) to go across it or around it. And not only is it that big, it's getting bigger. How is that possible? To what space is it moving out into? Well, it's moving out into the endless space that God has created in the universe. And so the universe is expanding. It's actually getting bigger, which is a crazy thought. And did you know that all of the bodies in God's creation, all of the celestial bodies, the planets, the stars, the meteorites, the comets, all of them are in motion. They are all moving, okay? Even galaxies themselves seem to be moving as one single unit across the universe as the galaxy, our Milky Way, has movement even inside of itself as planets are encircling stars like in our solar system and so the galaxies themselves are moving in fact scientists estimate that our sun is moving at approximately 450,000 miles per hour and the milky way galaxy itself as a unit which is fascinating is moving at about 2.1 million miles per hour across the universe where is it moving to well it's moving into the vastness of eternity as God's creation, from my belief, is endless. The Bible tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. There is no end to His creation. 
because he is an infinite and an endless and an all-powerful God. By the way, what's propelling the galaxies to move? What's propelling these objects in space to move? People used to think early on it was gravity. Well, it's not gravity. Scientists have discovered that gravity is not what's propelling galaxies and objects in space to move. So what is the force that's driving these things? What's the force that's expanding the universe, that's pushing the universe out and farther and deeper and growing it? Who is driving it? What's driving it? And so scientists have come up with this idea that there exists within the universe dark matter. They call it dark matter, which I think is unfortunate because in Scripture we read that darkness is associated with evil and light is associated with good. But the scientists have referred to this as dark matter and dark energy or dark power. Well, they call it dark because it reflects no light. It has no electromagnetic fields in it. You can't see it with the human eye. But it exists. In fact, they believe that only 5% of the universe is made up of things that you can actually see. That 95% of the universe is made up of what they call dark matter or dark energy. And this dark energy is extremely powerful. And it's pushing galaxies and planets and stars and the universe ever expanding out in all directions. It is moving. Listen to this verse from Jeremiah 10, verse 12, as Jeremiah is describing God's incredible nature. And I want to focus on one part of this. He says, but God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom. And then what does it say? He stretched out the heavens by his understanding. But listen, as I read these words and as we study the universe, we, we get a sense that we know the universe is being stretched out. It is moving out in all directions. So sometimes scientists believe that it started as a Big Bang. Well, I think the Big Bang was God said, God said, <laughs> God said, and then it happened, okay? Um, and so, but the heavens are being stretched out. Look at what Zechariah says in Zechariah 12, 1. He says, the Lord who stretches, who stretches out the heavens? <laughs> the Lord, the Lord God, he stretches out the heavens. He lays the foundations of the earth and he forms the human spirit within a person. Boy, I love that he says that, by the way. The same God that created all of the universe, the same God who is driving with, with his incredible power with his um with his omnipotent power he is driving all of the bodies of his creation outward they are moving it's almost as if he's he's there as a conductor and he's waving his uh his hands and he's directing this incredible orchestra and they are moving and they are acting upon his very whim and his very request and he is the force that is moving and stretching out the heavens. And, I love it, he forms the human spirit, the human spirit within a person. Not only is he the God that created all of the universe, but he's the God that created you. And he placed your spirit inside of you. In one of his books, A.M. Hunter, he was a New Testament scholar, he relates the story of a dying man who asked his Christian doctor to tell him something about the place to which he was going, thinking about the afterlife. And the doctor fumbled for a reply, and as he was thinking about what to say to this man, he, he heard a scratching at, at the door of his office, and, and then it came to him. And he answered this way. He says, do you hear that? He says, it's my dog. I left him downstairs but he's grown impatient and he's come up and he hears my voice and he has no notion what is inside of this door, but he knows that I am here. And it isn't the same with you and I. We don't know all the mysteries of what lies beyond the door or the mysteries of what we cannot see, but we do know that Jesus is there, that he is the creator of all things. And by the way, he is not just there, in some distant place. He is omnipresent. He is here too. 
He is everywhere. And you don't have to shout for God to hear you. Because he's not far away. He's nearby. And he has no problem hearing your prayers. You don't have to do some kind of a crazy ritual or some kind of a crazy dance. God is nearby. You don't have to shout for him to hear you. He's not far away. He's nearby. He has no problem hearing your prayers. And so Isaiah's words ring sort of powerful and true in our lives. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. You know, I, I heard this, uh, the, uh, or this thing about these two antennas that got married. You know, they said that the wedding was terrible, but the reception was great, you know? So, yeah. So you, you don't need to grow some big giant antenna, put a satellite dish out. You don't need any of that to communicate with God because he's right here. He is not far away. He is right here. You know, when I was a kid, I had this pet snake. His name was Huey. He was a hog-nosed snake, okay? And he was little. We got him as a baby, and my job was to feed him. And apparently, I did a terrible job feeding him, or maybe he was just a sick snake, but he never grew much. And then not long after I had him, maybe six months or so later, he died. But I really loved Huey, and, uh, and I would take him out with me outside and play with him. And, and he was just a little thing, you know, maybe about this long. And, and I would just carry him around and whatever. And I built this tree house in the backyard, and we had this block wall in the back, and there was a tree right in the alley on the other side of the block wall. But it was close enough, the trunk, that I could climb the block wall and get in the tree. Well, I would take Huey up into that tree with me, and we would hang out and have an adventure together in the tree. And, you know, he was my little snake buddy. <laughs> so, well, one day I was in the tree with Huey, and, uh, and I was coming down out of the tree, and I missed a step, and I fell straight down, boom. And I hit a branch on the way down, caught my chin, just busted my chin open, caught my arm on a branch too, messed my arm up. And, and I hit that ground, fell on the ground in the alley behind the block wall and, and in shock and just hurt and crying. And I must have been probably about eight years old or so. And I wasn't tall enough to reach over the gate, to unlatch the gate to get back in the yard. And blood's gushing everywhere. And I'm holding Huey and, I, and, I'm, and I'm praying that he's not dead. And, uh, and I'm screaming for help in the alley. And I sat out there for what seemed like an eternity. It was probably five minutes. But, but it seemed like an eternity for somebody to come and unlatch the gate and to help me and to let me back into the yard. And I just screamed and screamed. And then when I couldn't scream anymore, I would sit and just cry a little bit. And, and then I had blood all over the place. I ended up getting multiple stitches in my chin and other places. And, and so... Um, but finally, my mom heard me, and she came out and unlatched the gate, and she let me in, and I was saved. Look, God is not like that, by the way. If you find yourself behind the block wall, and you're all beat up, you don't have to shout and yell for God to hear you, for he is everywhere, and he is right there with you. He is the mighty God. He is in all places at all times. Isaiah says this about him. He says this in Isaiah 43. He says, as God, and God is speaking. This is God's words. He says, when you pass through the waters, he says, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, it says this about the Lord. It says, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. You know, the last, one of the last things Jesus said to his followers was that same statement. He says, listen, and lo, I will be with you always to the very end of the age, he says. And he's repeating that phrase there from Deuteronomy that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. He is the mighty God. He is all-powerful, but he is not a distant God who created things and just spun it into existence. He is a God that came nearby and stayed. He's a God that stepped out of eternity and went and walked on this earth. He's a God that humbled himself, 
was born in a stable, laid in a manger, was given to a young mom to nurse and to take care of. He is a God that is not far. He is a God that is near. The first thing that Isaiah says about Jesus, about this Savior, is that he is a wonderful counselor. Some translations um, will put a comma between wonderful and counselor. And some scholars say, well, he's giving two descriptions of Jesus. He's calling him wonderful and he's calling him counselor. And there are some good people out there that I've read that would say that's true, and there's others that would disagree. I kind of fall on the side where I think that if you read the entire verse, you'll see that there is a adjective before uh, the description of Jesus or who he is. And so we see here that I think I think that what he's saying is he's not wonderful and a counselor. I think it's saying he's a wonderful counselor. He's a mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. So we see here that Isaiah is describing him as the wonderful counselor. And why is he wonderful? Well, he's wonderful because he knows firsthand our pain and our difficulties. And he has the answers for our problems. And so he will be called the wonderful counselor. What an incredible thing. You see, the story of Christmas is the story of God's relentless love for us. He's the wonderful counselor. And the, the question I have in my mind as I think about him as the wonderful counselor, and, and I, I'll, I'm going to sort of explore this with you here in a little bit, but is this. Will you let him love you? And, and let, me, let me explain for a minute why I'm asking you this question. So the story of Christmas is the story of God's relentless love for us. He is the wonderful counselor. And the question looms is, will you let him love you. So as a counselor, he's like an advisor. In fact, some have said that the description of Jesus as the wonderful counselor means that he's like the person that's advising the kings or the person that's advising uh, the, the government officials or he is that kind of a counselor. He is an advisor. He's also a guide. He's the one who makes your path straight. He's a light unto your feet and a light unto your path. He leads you beside the quiet waters, and he restores your soul. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the guide. He also has all of the answers, by the way. He is the counselor that you come to that when you have these problems and issues, he doesn't say, you know what, I'll get back to you on that one. That's a great question. (laughs) He has all the answers. And I think in the most profound way, as we think about who he is and what he is and what he's done for us, he is the kind of counselor that can relate to us. He can say, I feel your pain, or I've been there. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be rejected by people. I know what it's like to be lonely and alone. I know what it's like to experience physical pain. I know what it's like to be hungry, to be tired, to be thirsty. I know what it's like to be challenged by sort of the whims of the world and to be told that you need to live and do a certain thing and and you know that God's calling you to something else. I know what that's like. I have felt that pressure. And so Isaiah says this about Jesus. He says, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. He says this in Isaiah 11 too. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, speaking of Jesus, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, and the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And Paul says this, he says, Christ, in whom all or in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Jesus possesses all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He has it all. You know, the present thought in counseling, and for me, being, being a school psychologist and gone through multiple counseling classes, Um, I can speak to this firsthand, that the present thought in counseling is simply this, that you should, as a counselor or as a therapist, maintain um, a clinical relationship with your client and uh, and not get too emotionally attached or involved. And so, you know, there's definitely some wisdom in that, in creating this, what I would call a sterile environment. 
Um, and that sterility is not the kind of environment, by the way, in my mind, that promotes emotional or psychological or even spiritual healing. See, a sterile environment may be the ideal environment for, for promoting physical recoveries from a physical illness. We, that's why our hospitals are all so clean. And we don't want to touch them. We want to wear masks. We, we want to put on gowns. We want to stay away from this, the patient because we, we don't want them to be infected. And so we create this sterile environment. But sterile environments are void of human connection. And I don't think sterile environments can heal the human soul. And so God, in his great wisdom, he stepped out of eternity and he came to the earth and he came nearby. You know, you'd be hard-pressed to find a counselor in the world today that when you walk into their office and you sit down in the chair, you sit down on the couch or whatever it is, you'd be hard-pressed to find one that would say genuinely, sitting across from, from you, I love you. I love you. Let's assume for a moment, though, that they did. Let's say you were having some difficulties and you went to the counselor and you were seeking some advice and some help. And you sat in that chair and the counselor said, I love you. How many of you would actually believe them? Would you believe them that they loved you? See, I think for most of us, in fact, probably all of us, we would say, no. I mean, I just met them. I mean, how can they, how can they love me? I mean, hi, you know, my name's Chris. Nice to meet you. Here's my problems. Well, I love you. Well, what are you talking about? I just met you. Well, I love you. You know, th this is the story of God. He's the kind of God that he came to the earth. He lived the lives that we are all called to live. He took on flesh and blood. He came nearby. He got close, as close as he possibly could. And he says, I love you. You know, one of the challenges of working with abused and abandoned or neglected children is convincing them to put down their guard and to let you love them. That's the biggest challenge. I, I, I can't remember if I've shared this story with you or not, but there was a young boy who was 13 years old over in Chino at the group home that I worked at. And uh, he was a mess like all the other kids. He, uh, he couldn't attend public school because his behavior was just too bad. And so he was a part of the non-public school. Uh, and the non-public school, was a, it's an intense learning environment where the student-to-teacher ratio is one-to-one. -one. And, uh, and so uh, that, those schools and those environments are created to deal with and handle and educate, if you will, the most difficult of children. And Stephen was one of those. And he was put at the non-public school. And one day, Stephen was at the school, and he went in a rage. And I don't know what set him off, but he just started to rage. And, uh, and the school where he was was not far from where my office was when I worked at the group home. And, and, uh, and on this particular day, he decided he was going to just destroy the classroom. And he did. He turned over every desk. He actually picked up a desk and threw it for, through the window of the classroom. And he was just raging. And, uh, and I was new to the group home, and I was coming around and uh, decided, you know what, I think I'm going to, on this day, I'm going to go and spend some time at the non-public school that was on campus and sort of familiarize myself with this place and see what the staff are doing, and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm the, I'm the chaplain. I'm the new chaplain there. And when I get there, uh, I arrive to this scene as it unfolds in front of me, and, uh, and I can see there's a crowd of people outside of the school as I'm walking across the field there that's, that leads up to this, this small school. And there's a crowd of people. Some are on the ground, and some are standing and as I get a little closer, I, I walk up to someone that I had met recently, and I said, what's going on here? And they explained to me that Stephen was having a bad day. <laughs> and, they, and for me, it was, that was the understatement of the century. And I saw the broken window. I saw the mess coming outside of that school. And as I looked over, I could see Stephen on the ground. Now, this was the first experience for me. I had never seen a person restrained before. 
I didn't know what that looked like, and it was jarring, and this image has been burned in my mind because of that. And, uh, but they were restraining Stephen on the ground. And uh, there were several adults that had his arms outstretched and were on his body holding him down. And I thought, boy, this scene is, this is a, this is a crazy scene. And, uh, and I stood off just far enough that I wasn't sort of part of it, but I could hear and listen to what was happening. And as I stood there, uh, Stevens was fighting with everything in his body to try to break free of, of these people that were holding him down. And he was enraged. And you could see the anger, and you could see his body just tensing and fighting. And, and it, it was a fight. I mean, it was a fight. And then as I watched... There was another fellow there who wasn't holding Stephen down, but he was kneeling down by Stephen's head, by his face. His name was Dave, and he was Stephen's social worker. I later learned that if you restrain a child and they don't calm down after five minutes, you have to have permission from the social worker to continue the restraint. Well, Stephen hadn't calmed down And they had called the social worker, and the social worker came running down to where he was and had kneeled down by Stephen's face as Stephen was just enraged and fighting. And the question, I think, that Stephen was wrestling with was, am I lovable? That that was the question. And the question that the staff were asking Stephen in this moment as I watched was, will you let us love you? And as I listened to Dave, the social worker there, he was a, he's a good Christian man. He's pastoring a church now in Ontario. I could hear Dave saying some things to Stephen that changed my life, actually. And I heard him say, Stephen, I love you. I thought, this is a social worker. Like, what is he doing? Stephen, I love you. It's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Just just calm down and relax. It's going to be okay. And he just whispered into Stephen's ear for moment after moment. And Stephen's rage just broke after several minutes as I stood there and watched. And his body just went limp. And, and the anger and the screaming and the cussing, because he was saying all the things you could imagine a kid would say in a state like that, just went away, and he just began to weep. And as he wept, all the staff just got up. They just got off of him and got up. And this 13-year-old boy curled up into a ball into Dave's arms. And he let Dave love him. He hadn't let anybody love him, maybe ever. And in those moments, I had an opportunity to witness a wonderful counselor. And so the question is, will you let him love you? Will you let him in? You see, the story of Christmas is the story of God's relentless love for us. He is the wonderful counselor. Will you let him love you? Where is God now, you may ask? Where is he? You see, he's not far off. He's not turned his back on you. He is here. You see, he came down from glory. He set aside all the privileges of deity. He overcame the barrier of sin that separated us from heaven. And that silent night, that silent night so long ago, Darkness was invaded by light. And why did he come? Well, the Bible says that he loves you. And he came to give his life for you. And so the question looms, 
Will you look to him today? Will you come and see the baby that was born? Will you believe that he is the Son of God who came to take away the sin of the world? Will you let him love you today? I want to end with this quote by David Jeremiah. He says, he not only hears my prayers, but he knows what to do with them. Isn't that wonderful? Our Savior, our Jesus, the wonderful Counselor, and the mighty God. He is a God that is nearby. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you so much for this day. We just want to thank you, God, for being the kind of God that that is not distant, the kind of God that hasn't turned his back on his creation on us, but the kind of God that loves us. Thank you for being nearby, Lord. Thank you for not abandoning us in our sin. Thank you for loving us enough to come and to give your life for us on a cross. Thank you for being born in that manger, in that stable, and and laid in that manger. Thank you, God. I want to ask you this simple question. Maybe you're here today, and, and you don't know for sure that if you were to die, that you would go to heaven. If I were to ask you the simple question, do you know for sure, I mean, without a doubt, that if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven? Maybe your answer would be, no, I don't know. I don't know for sure, but I, I want to know. I really want to know. If that's you, I want to give you an opportunity right now to give your life to Jesus, to allow him to love you. And so if that's you and you're, you're making that decision today, you're saying, yes, God, I'm willing to let you in. I'm going to surrender to you and allow you to love me. If that's you, I, I want to invite you to stand up. Just right where you're sitting, this is your chance to say, I'm all in. I'm giving my life to him. I'm allowing him to come in. If that's you, you stand. Maybe you're listening online. If you're listening online, I want to give you an opportunity to do the same thing. You can just lift your hand. You can stand. You can just indicate right now that you want to give your life to Jesus. That you're willing in this moment to let him love you and to let him in. And so, Lord, I pray for those who are making that decision today. I just thank you, God, that you do love them and that you do desire to change their lives and to heal them from the inside out. What an incredible gift. Thank you for coming for them and for us. And so if that's you, I just want to leave you in a simple prayer. You can just say this simple prayer to God. You can just tell him right now in your own words. You don't even have to say it out loud. You can just say it in your heart to him. Lord Jesus, I desperately need you in my life. You can thank him for coming into your life. Thank him for loving you. Thank him for giving his life on a cross, for taking the punishment for your sins upon himself, and for offering you this wonderful gift of eternal life. And invite him to come into your life today to be your wonderful counselor and mighty God. And thank him for saving you. And Lord, I pray for those who have prayed that prayer today. Would you bless them? Would today be that special day where they've walked from darkness to light, where they have finally made the decision to allow you to love them. And for us, Lord, as we're thinking about Christmas and as we're busy and planning and doing all these things, and and for maybe some, Lord, this is a sad time and maybe a lonely time. I just pray that you would help us to remember that you are here, that we are not alone, that you are nearby, and that we have so many good things and great things to be thankful for. And so help us to give with the same kind of joy that you gave. Help us to reflect that love, Lord, in the lives of those that we meet and come in contact with, with our family members and our friends. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.